Konami says they're coming out with the TurboGrafx-16 mini console. The TurboGrafx-16. What a beautiful thing. This is a surprise. Frankly, a lot of people feel the TurboGrafx-16 didn't do very well in the United States. In fact, I venture to guess that many people don't even know what it is. But Creative Cat Productions remembers. Instead of game cartridges, it used a slick little hue card, or turbo chip as we called them over here. You could also buy a $400 CD-ROM drive. It plugged into a port in the back of the system, allowing you to play CD-ROM based games. In total, there were 138 games released in the United States, and almost all of them were on the Hue cards. Only 21 CD-ROM games were released here, though there were many more that stayed in Japan. Many of the games on the TurboGrafx-16 were very good. My personal favorite might be Ninja Spirit. They've already said that this will be included on the TurboGrafx-16 Mini. Nice choice. Ninja Spirit will get its own video in the future. So what happened? People liked the TurboGrafx-16. It had great games, and good reviews with the nascent video game press. Then why did the TurboGrafx-16 fail in the United States? This is the story. The TurboGrafx-16 got a US launch in the summer of 1989, thanks to the partnership of two different Japanese companies, NEC and Hudson Soft. NEC, or the Nippon Electric Company, is a tech giant still active all over the world today. In the early 80s, they were well known in Japan for their PC-88 computer. We think of Apple or IBM, the Japanese will remember NEC, among others. Hudson Soft was the other company that gave us the TurboGrafx-16. In the 1980s, they were mostly a video game developer. They made games for Nintendo, including a port of Load Runner in 1984 that sold more than a million copies. They created Bomberman, and the Adventure Island series as well. Hudson Soft had a reputation for both quality and fun, and they were a big part of Nintendo's success in the video game console market of the 1980s. Nintendo was really big back then. Sure, they're big now, but in the 1980s, Nintendo essentially monopolized the home video game market in both Japan and the United States, with their Famicom and NES consoles respectively. Video games generated billions of dollars in sales, and Nintendo was almost the sole beneficiary of a booming industry. But even in 1983, the new Nintendo video game console only offered players so-so technology, Using the same 8-bit Moe 6502 processor that you'd find in an Apple II computer or Atari 2600 from 1977. Nintendo's home version of Donkey Kong looked and performed great, but arcade games had advanced rapidly in only a few years. Hudson Soft was not content with Nintendo's dated technology, and so they decided to close the widening gap between the home video game market and the rapidly advancing arcades. Hudson Soft engineers designed an improved version of the 8-bit CPU behind Nintendo's console and added a vastly enhanced custom chipset to the motherboard. Doing so greatly increased the CPU's processing speed and quadrupled the system's working RAM. They also added two separate 16-bit graphics processors, which allowed for higher resolution graphics, more sprites on screen, and more than 10 times as many colors than what Nintendo was capable of. Hudson Soft took their new prototype to Nintendo as a proposed upgrade to the Famicom and NES. Nintendo turned them down. The video game giant had no incentive to share profits with Hudson Soft, and the NES was still only starting to hit its stride in a hot North American market. Further, investing in the production of an entirely new piece of hardware would have split their own market into separate competing consoles. If Sega's taught us all anything, it's that splitting your own market is a really bad idea. Meanwhile, NEC noticed Nintendo's success with Envy. Shortly after the explosive rise of the Famicom, NEC began soliciting various video game development and arcade companies to help them enter into the home console market so that they could compete with Nintendo. When they saw that Hudson Soft had already developed a new piece of hardware, rejected by Nintendo, a partnership was soon formed. NEC would cover the manufacture, sale, and marketing of the hardware, and Hudson Soft would be paid a royalty on the production of consoles and provide exclusive games. In October of 1987, Hudson Soft and NEC's new video game console had become a reality in Japan. 
known as the PC Engine, it would go on to sell over 500,000 units within its first month on Japanese store shelves alone. By the end of 1988, in spite of facing direct competition from Sega's new 16-bit Mega Drive in October of that same year, the PC Engine was ultimately crowned the highest selling video game console in all of Japan. Why was it so successful? Was it really successful? The PC Engine was, in fact, a success in 1987 and 1988 in terms of new console sales, but only in terms of new console sales. Nintendo had launched their hardware in 1983, more than four years prior, meaning that by the time the PC Engine came out, the market for Nintendo's hardware had likely reached the point of saturation. Everyone who was going to buy a Nintendo probably already had. Further, the PC Engine launched virtually unopposed in 1987. They were eventually squared off against Sega's formidable new Mega Drive, which had even more advanced hardware. But that didn't come to pass for an entire year, giving the PC Engine enough time to grow a library of games and to gain a foothold in the market. It's surprising to note, however, that the PC Engine only launched with two games, a video game version of Mahjong known as Shanghai, and Bakuraman. Bakuraman? And there would only be a handful of new games by the end of 1987. So why? Why did the Japanese buy over 500,000 units of the PC Engine in a month? Did they just love video mahjong? Well, advanced new hardware is always exciting, especially if that new hardware is the only game in town. And NEC was a well-respected household name in Japan, as was Hudson Soft as a game developer. So the product was coming from a well-respected and well-known source, but as history has taught us, it takes a lot more than advanced hardware and good reputation to launch a video game console. You have to have the games and the killer app, if you will. And for the PC Engine, the killer app was Bakuraman. At the time of the PC Engine's launch, Bakuraman was a very popular new animated TV series in Japan. The Bakuraman video game was based on that popular IP, but there's more. The Bakuraman TV show itself was actually based on a very popular Japanese snack food, also known as Bakuraman, that had reached the status of massive fad in Japan by the mid-80s. The snack is a waffle-like cookie with a chocolate center, sort of a Kit Kat in reverse, and fairly unremarkable on its own merits. But what makes Bakuraman successful, and where it got its name, which literally means something like Surprise Man, was with the inclusion of collectible stickers. When the Bakuraman video game launched exclusively on the PC Engine in 1987, it was really part of a much larger Bakuraman craze, and that means Bakuraman was, for all intents and purposes, a killer app. But wait, there's still more. Astute observers will note that the Bakuraman video game looks awfully familiar. Indeed, it's not just a Bakuraman video game, but it's actually a near-perfect port of the popular arcade game Wonder Boy in Monsterland. By itself, this game might have been popular enough to generate early interest in the PC Engine, but tying in the hugely popular Bakuraman was a stroke of genius, and, I think, probably the main reason the PC Engine got such a strong launch in Japan in the first place. Exciting new hardware, unopposed in the market, with Bakuraman! The success of the PC Engine in Japan, and the massive success of the NES in the US, pushed NEC to action. A plan for a US launch of the new system was quickly put in motion. The task was forwarded over to NEC's American offices in Chicago, and a team of industry veterans, mostly from Atari, were put together to make the launch happen. But NEC's early success with the console was about to change for the worse. The PC Engine had enjoyed an unopposed market in Japan, but delays caused by prolonged US market research U.S. rebranding and a complete redesign and renaming of the hardware meant that the PC Engine wouldn't come to the United States until the summer of 1989, almost two years after the console launched in Japan. Meanwhile, the next generation of 16-bit consoles had already arrived. In 1988, Sega released their technically impressive Sega Mega Drive in Japan, but to little fanfare. However, by the time the Mega Drive was launched in the U.S., as the Sega Genesis, in August of 1989, Sega had largely gotten their act together. The Sega Genesis launched in the US with a formidable library of games built up over the previous year. Costing $189, the system included a decent port of the arcade hit Altered Beast as a pack-in game, 
And Sega was about getting their message out there too. Thanks to the newfound popularity of video game magazines and heavy marketing, many people knew about the string of arcade heavy hitters that were going to be coming soon, and exclusively to the Sega Genesis. Games like Capcom's Ghouls and Ghosts and Forgotten Worlds. More importantly, Sega was promising a high quality port of the hit game Golden Axe by the end of 1989, as well as an exclusive sequel to Shinobi that looked like nothing that had ever come before it. I remember the hype! It was tangible. At the same time, Nintendo continued to steadily dominate the US both in pop culture and at the toy store. The Super Mario Brothers and Zelda TV show also first aired in the fall of 1989, just a couple of months after the launch of both the Sega Genesis and the TurboGrafx-16. Millions of American children were eagerly looking forward to the long-awaited and universally acclaimed Super Mario Bros. 3, which would finally be released in the US early in 1990. It is no exaggeration to say that for American kids in 1989, Mario and Luigi had become as recognizable and beloved as Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck had been to previous American generations. So when the TurboGrafx-16 was finally released in American stores in the August of 1989 for $200, that is $10 more than the Sega Genesis, and $50 to $100 more than the most popular Nintendo bundles, they were now doing so against very stiff competition. To make matters worse, the long delays that came with transforming the PC Engine into the TurboGrafx-16 meant that the system would launch two full weeks after the US launch of the Sega Genesis. It is unfortunate for NEC and Hudsonsoft that the same console that had beaten Sega to the market in Japan by a full year somehow still managed to come out late in the United States. So how did the TurboGrafx-16 do? By all accounts, the US release of the TurboGrafx-16 went terribly for NEC Hudsonsoft. In anticipation of a big successful pre-Christmas launch, they went ahead and manufactured 750,000 TurboGrafx-16 consoles. However, by the end of the year, NEC had only sold around 300,000 consoles. And months later, they still struggled to sell any of the units from that first batch of 750,000. When initial summer sales were slow, no one worried. But when the critical 1989 holiday sales season came and went without an increase in sales or any new public interest, the writing was on the wall. By 1991, NEC in Japan abandoned the US version of the console completely, giving control over to a new subsidiary called Turbo Technologies, which was temporarily created for the sole purpose of trying to get rid of overstock and minimize the commercial catastrophe that was the TurboGrafx-16 in America. What was to blame? Was the late launch of the TurboGrafx-16 the reason the console failed in America? Had Sega simply beaten them to the punch? Not necessarily. Being the first to launch a next-gen console doesn't guarantee success. The Sega Saturn launched months ahead of the Sony PlayStation and Nintendo 64, and yet was summarily crushed. The Sega Master System had been out well before the PC Engine in Japan, and yet its existence never mattered there. The SG-1000 launched on the very same day as the Famicom in 1983, and few people have even heard of it. It takes more to render your console irrelevant in the American marketplace. But let's see what else NEC in America did in order to make just that happen. But the TurboGrafx-16 launched with a very good set of games. In terms of sheer quality, there was a decent racing game by Hudsonsoft called Victory Run, an excellent pinball simulator called Alien Crush, a great platformer in the legendary axe, and an odd and somewhat misunderstood China Warrior. Then there was the fun multiplayer action RPG Dungeon Explorer, and a phenomenal, even legendary shooter in Blazing Lasers. And then there was a very mediocre pack-in game included with the system called Keith Courage and Alpha Zone. Keith Courage was actually an anime tie-in to a show that was completely alien to American audiences, which makes its inclusion as the pack-in game that much more baffling. But outside of Keith Courage, these are really good games from an objective point of view. But it's also notable that these first launch games would have all been completely unfamiliar to US gamers. 
The Genesis, on the other hand, had key arcade standouts and licenses featuring well-known figures such as Tommy Lasorda and freaking Rambo. On the other hand, the NES was so big in the US that they were printing their characters on kids' underwear. The turbo graphics by comparison just seemed generic. How ironic! When the PC Engine was known for its many ties to anime, television, and Japanese pop culture in general. In fact, several big games released in 1989 were actually tie-ins to Japanese pop culture. So, in a way, perhaps it really could be said that the TurboGrafx-16 was lacking games? Not necessarily good games, it had plenty of those, but rather it lacked the right kind of familiar games one would want to compete with popular IPs in Sega and Nintendo. Maybe. But the TurboGrafx-16 wasn't completely lacking. Not so much that it should have been knocked out of the console race altogether. After all, very soon the TurboGrafx-16 library was joined by plenty of well-known games. Vigilante, Sidearms, Galaga 88, and a nearly arcade-perfect port of the popular space shooter, R-Type. Despite being relatively generic and untested by comparison to Nintendo and Sega, the Turbo Graphics plainly did have the games needed to be successful, and by the end of 1989, it really should have been able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with at least the Sega Genesis, with bona fide classics like R-Type, Blazing Lasers, The Legendary Axe, and eventually Bonk's Adventure, which really could have and should have been released by December of 1989, but more on that later. There are a couple of myths that need to be addressed about the nature of the TurboGrafx's game lineup from this time period. One is the claim that NEC failed to bring over enough of their games from Japan. And two is the claim that the TurboGrafx was somehow crippled by Nintendo's exclusivity deals with third-party developers. By the time the TurboGrafx-16 launched in the US, the PC Engine had only managed to muster up around 50 Hue card based games. Yes, over a two-year period, there weren't that many games for the console. However, many of those games were, in fact, very good. Good enough to compete with Nintendo, which of course the PC Engine actually managed to do for a time. And of those 50 games, almost all of the most relevant and worthwhile were in fact brought over to the United States before the end of 1987. The games left in Japan were almost all difficult to translate JRPGs or Japanese board games and mahjong titles. Second, the Turbo Graphics was not stifled by Nintendo's anti-competition exclusivity contracts the way people think. In brief, Nintendo used to insist on agreements such that their third-party developers weren't allowed to release games made for Nintendo on a competitor's consoles. This only makes sense. If you want to make Super Fighter Bomber 1000 on the NES, you aren't allowed to just release Super Fighter Bomber across every other platform, too. This was to ensure that games on the Nintendo were uniquely interesting to consumers, and not just rehashes of games appearing on other platforms. Many have taken this to mean that third-party game developers weren't allowed to produce games for other consoles in the 80s and early 90s. This is completely false. The PC Engine actually had tons of third-party support in the form of Namco, Messiah, Konami, Irem, Naxit, Taito, and even Capcom, among others. If anything, Nintendo's exclusivity policy only helped the TurboGrafx-16 because it ensured that the TurboGrafx also had a unique library of games that weren't simply rehashes of games already playable on a Nintendo console. The TurboGrafx-16 had third-party support and a decent-sized library of quality games, some of which were arcade standouts. Again, the outstanding port of R-Type was so good and the arcade game so popular that it really should have been the TurboGrafx-16 system seller from the get-go. Why wasn't that the packing game? To summarize, the TurboGrafx-16 did have good games in those first critical months leading up to the Christmas season of 1989, but compared to the NES and Genesis, the games were not quite as recognizable. But this lack of recognizability wasn't a function of NEC's failure to import PC Engine games. That failure would come later. Nor was it due to an injunction imposed by Nintendo upon third-party developers. But what about the box art? 
A lot of people like to harp on the TurboGrafx-16's horrible box art. Could it have been part of the problem? Good point. It might have. Let's compare the box art. In 1989, regular people still didn't have access to the internet, and gaming magazines were in their infancy. So box art was still one of the most important modes for marketing your game, perhaps the single most important. Look at these Genesis games. Super Thunderblade is an awful game, but this box art just screams bad ass. Blazing Lasers for the TurboGrafx-16 on the other hand, though an incredible game, looks like an Atari game from the late 70s. Look at Ghouls and Ghosts on the Sega Genesis. This box art is a masterpiece. Now compare it to the Legendary Axe. I'm not even 100% sure what I'm looking at. I think it's fairly true to the game, with spiders and all that, but it's just so unappealing. Now here's Dungeon Explorer, a strong launch game for the Turbo Graphics, but you wouldn't be able to tell by looking at the box art. Now here's the last battle for the Sega Genesis. Which game would you rather have, going on nothing else but box art? I hope you pick Dungeon Explorer, because the last battle is horrible. So why was American interest in the Turbo Graphics so poor? The usual narrative is as follows. The games weren't as well known to consumers, and NEC apparently wasn't as good at marketing their products as Sega or Nintendo, who both had better advertising and box art for their games. Further, the Turbo Graphics had a very poor choice of packing game and Keith Courage. But does this explain the whole story? It couldn't possibly. Like I said, the Turbo Graphics started off somewhat generically, but it was eventually joined by plenty of well-known and critically acclaimed video games. Further, it's not like they were alone in producing terrible box art. The NES and Sega Genesis were both plagued with bad box art too. Check out the bafflingly bad box art for the US version of Mega Man, or the box art for Sega's flagship mascot, Alex Kidd on the Sega Genesis. Not everything Sega put out was as cool as Revenge of Shinobi or Golden Axe. And while the Keith Courage pack-in game was lame, was Altered Beast really the best choice for a pack-in game on the Genesis? The NES was still packing their consoles with the original Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt, two games that were really starting to show their age. At the same time, if we're being honest, we have to admit that the TurboGrafx-16 had a lot going for it. Even from day one it produced games that were every bit as impressive as the Sega Genesis. And say what you will about the large black casing of the console, but the TurboGrafx-16 looked awesome, and the name is frankly far more descriptive and interesting than the thematically confusing Genesis. Genesis? Whoa, what the heck is that? Some kind of electronic Bible? So here we are, right back at square one, asking ourselves, why did the TurboGrafx-16 fail in America? The usual talk about there not being enough games, or the lack of third-party development, or appeals to box art, and the choice of a packing game, just really aren't that persuasive when you think about it. But there's really one major, and really far more obvious fact about the TurboGrafx-16's launch that not enough people are talking about. Let me break it down. As a parent who buys video game stuff for his kids, I think I know what happened. Let's take a trip down memory lane and piece together what life was like for the American gamer in 1989. In the United States in 1989, gamers were almost exclusively children or teenagers, and video games were largely perceived as toys. If kids got video game consoles or new video games, then they got them through the filter of their parents, and the parents of kids in 1989 were very different from parents today. They were the baby boomers. They didn't grow up in a world of personal electronics and computers, and they largely didn't get it. To them, video games were all pretty much the same thing, from one console to another. It's that little gizmo that plugs into the living room TV that little Billy loves so much. It's loud. It's annoying. Many games contain content that is deeply disturbing. They didn't understand bits nor did they appreciate the technical advancements from one generation of consoles to the next. Hell, parents in America thought the Super Nintendo was some kind of scam. All they knew was that their kids liked the stupid things. It wouldn't stop begging for them because the kid down the street had one. And so when they could, they bought them. And these things were, in 1989 dollars, very expensive for the average American family. 
When adjusted for inflation, the TurboGrafx-16 and Sega Genesis both cost around $400 a piece. And this was at a time when a lot of people still had only one television in their home. Clueless and different parents. A high price tag and limited space in your living room means that if you were getting a video game console in 1989, it was almost certainly going to be a big expense at Christmas. And you sure as hell weren't getting more than one. Ever. Or at least until you got a summer job and your own TV in your bedroom. But those days came way later. Very few people had more than one console back then. Which is why American kids famously engaged in their silly console war battles at school. Once you were Sega or Nintendo or Turbo Graphics, you felt like you were that for life. So this made that first Christmas season for the Turbo Graphics 16 absolutely critical. Because once those American families bought a Sega Genesis or an NES, if they hadn't already bought one, they were more or less gone for good as potential customers. So why didn't the baby boomers buy their kids the Turbo Graphics 16 then? Plenty of people bought a Genesis, at least eventually and it seemed like everyone had a Nintendo. It's simple. It's because the TurboGrafx-16 was the most expensive, and it launched with a baffling array of mandatory peripherals that made it not just the most expensive, but prohibitively expensive. What do I mean? To illustrate this, let's imagine you're the parents of little 10-year-old Billy here, born in 1979. Billy's been wanting one of those fandangled Nintendo game machines that everyone's been talking about. So in the fall of 1989, after work, you drive down to Toys R Us to check it out. There's no internet to research the darn things, and you certainly don't know about the kiddie video game magazines that have only just started to pop up all over the country. No, all you know about video games comes to you by word of mouth, seeing kids throw away money at arcades, or just advertising. And if not for your son, you'd ignore all of it. After all, it's a silly fad, right? Like disco. But you remember when you were a kid, and you wanted that Red Ryder BB gun so bad. Was this Billy's BB gun? Walking into the store, you find that it's easy to locate all the Nintendos. In fact, there's a giant red sign hanging overhead proudly declaring that you are currently in the world of Nintendo. But quickly you realize how in over your head you actually are. There isn't just one Nintendo to choose from, but rather a bunch of Nintendos. On a bargain bin shelf you see a ratty looking thing called an Atari 7800. You remember Atari, and how it quickly grew in popularity only to completely implode a few years later. Remembering the news, you instinctively know, this is the wrong Nintendo. But adorning the rest of the aisles and shelves in the world of Nintendo are complicated kiosks, loudly featuring all the other Nintendos. The Sega Master System. The Nintendo Nintendo. The Sega Genesis? Genesis? What is it, an electronic bible? And then there's something called a TurboGrafx-16. There are no physical games to look at here, just the kiosks featuring the machines, and row upon row of overwhelmingly colorful cards, each representing a different video game. $40, $50, $60. The price is so high, and yet there are so many. Who can afford all of these? You skip over the master system. There's no real information about it or marketing materials, just a nonchalant ticket for the machine and some very uninteresting looking box art. But the Nintendo Nintendo, Sega Genesis Nintendo, and TurboGrafx-16 Nintendo are well represented all over the place. And there are a lot of different game videotape thingies to choose from. Perplexed, you find a 19-year-old store clerk to help you out. His name is Brad. He has a mullet. Um, so like, your kid wants a Nintendo? That's correct, Bradley. Which one is the best one? Oh, okay, dude, like, there's just one Nintendo Nintendo, but these ones are new. Brad points to the Sega Genesis and Turbo Graphics. Hmm, are these any good? Do the kids like these? Um, like, yeah, I guess so. Okay, so, what's the difference? Um, like, these are the newest kind. They have, like, better graphics and stuff. They're 16-bit. 16 what? 16 bits. I'm sorry, Bradley, I don't know what that is. What is a bit? 
it just like uh, means these games are more like technological and stuff, um, but they also cost more. Interesting. How much more, Bradley? Um, the old Nintendos come in different sets. You can get it for like a hundred bucks, but you can also get it with games, controllers, and the gun for a hundred fifty bucks. Wow, that's pretty stiff for a toy, isn't it? Yeah, but the Genesis is like a hundred and ninety bucks. A hundred and ninety dollars? Yeah, pretty much. Okay, but what's this over here? This TurboGrafx-16. What is all this stuff? Oh, it's new like the Genesis, but uh, it comes with a bunch more stuff. Oh? Do tell. Yeah, it's got like all this stuff over here. $25 for a Turbo Tap. $20 for a Turbo Booster. $400 for a Turbo CD? $400? What in the world is a CD? Well, this is the system here for $200. But if you want the total turbo system, you have to get all these too. For $450 on top of $200? That's more than $700 after sales tax. Are you daft, man? That's more than my mortgage. Um, I guess. Has anyone bought this thing? Well, I've seen a couple people buy the Turbo Graphics console by itself in our type. But no one's ever bought the Turbo CD. $400 is pretty gnarly. You're not kidding, Bradley. <laughs> so what's this Genesis thing over here? It's new too? Well, you know, with this one you get what you see. It's just uh, the system, a game, and a controller. $190. Well, is it any good? Why is it so much cheaper? Yeah, um, I think it's pretty good. People like it alright. It just doesn't have a CD player or anything like that. But it's still fun, right? Sure, like, if you like arcade games, it's got Ghouls and Ghosts, and Altered Beast, Super Thunderblade, Space Harrier... Whoa, slow down, son. I don't know anything that's coming out of your mouth. Does it have the Super Mario Brothers? Nah, dude, that's only on Nintendo. Which Nintendo? That's the Nintendo Nintendo. The cheap one. Super Mario Brothers comes with it. And sometime next year, there's supposed to be a big sequel that's really big in Japan. What's that, Bradley? Pearl Harbor 2? <laughs> uh, what? <laughs> Never mind, Bradley. So, what you're saying is that for $150, I can get the Nintendo Nintendo. What did you say it came with? Where are all the other peripherals? It's got everything in one box. The system, two controllers, the gun, and it comes with Super Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt. But if you wait a little while, the same set's gonna be going on sale for $100 in December. $100? Hmm. Cutting it a little close, but that just might work. Hmm. Hmm. Bradley! Bradley! Thank God it's you, son! Where's the Nintendo Nintendo action set with the Mario and Duck Hunt guns and all that? Where did it go? Oh, um, we like, sold out. Bradley, no! You can't sell out! I need it, Bradley! I need a Nintendo for my kid! Well, uh, we still got a bunch of TurboGrafx-16s and Sega Genesis's. Oh? Really? Look, Bradley, you swear to me, the Sega Genesis has no crazy expensive CD add-on that my kid is gonna cry about later, does it? Yeah, dude, I swear! Sega doesn't even make an overpriced, underperforming CD-based add-on with a tiny library of mediocre games. Not for, like, two more years, dude. All right, Bradley. I'll take one Sega Genesis. Wrap one up for me, and I'll also take a copy of Google the Ghosts, just for good measure. And that is the true story of how hundreds of thousands of American kids wound up with the Sega Genesis the Christmas of 1989. I think more than any other factor, the TurboGrafx-16 was destroyed by its higher price tag and large assortment of prohibitively expensive and apparently mandatory peripherals. And you have to realize that NEC in the US was a big part of the problem. 
because they consciously led consumers to feel this way. They actually marketed the $200 TurboGrafx-16 plus the $400 Turbo CD as being the total TurboGrafx super system, implying that unless you forked over $400 additional dollars, you were somehow not even really getting the complete package. Never mind the fact that you needed to buy a Turbo Tap in order to play multiplayer games, or a Turbo Booster for AV Stereo Out, two features that were industry standards at the time. Consumers don't want to do that, especially not confused parents. Sega and Nintendo both, conversely, were able to offer what consumers felt was a complete product at a cost that far, far undercut the disastrously expensive Total Turbo Graphics Superset. So instead of giving the appearance of having a sophisticated next-gen super product, all NEC accomplished was to completely cut themselves out of the market almost entirely. And the crazy thing is, NEC seems to have realized this. Why else do you think Turbo Technologies Inc. came out with the Turbo Duo console a couple years later? Recombining the TurboGrafx-16 and Turbo CD into a single lower cost product. This is how NEC and Hudson Soft's incredible joint venture managed to fail in the US, even after a successful launch in Japan. Did it have to be this way? Could they have successfully split the console wars three ways? I think that they could have. First, we have to acknowledge that NEC and Hudson Soft did do a lot right. Lots of people think the Turbo Graphics was killed by long delayed launch in the US, and therefore they believe that the time taken to rebrand and repackage the PC Engine as the Turbo Graphics was a huge misstep. I actually strongly disagree with this. As I've already pointed out, being first doesn't necessarily help or hurt sales of video game consoles but perception of quality, value, and the right games does. The original name and look of the PC Engine was not a good fit for the US market at all. The name PC Engine is strange and confusing. Japanese consumers naturally associated the console with NEC's celebrated line of computers, but Americans don't know anything about NEC or the PC-88. The name would have made people think the product was intended perhaps for spreadsheets and word processing, not playing video games. Also, a lot of gamers to this day like the look of the small white hardware casing, but I personally think it looks more like a toy than high-end consumer electronics. I think the redesign was necessary and smart on the part of NEC. They produced a final product that had a more descriptive name and put it in a package that was far more attractive and eye-catching than the original Japanese console. Which do you think American families would rather have sitting in their living rooms? The delayed launch also ensured that the US got a wide variety of good games to help support the system right off the bat. But there were critical mistakes made at this juncture too. Redesigning the hardware and not going a step further to include both AV stereo out and at least one additional controller port was a huge missed opportunity. Second, the US launch should not have included the Turbo CD add-on until the following conditions were met. One, there was at least a handful of decent games on offer, which there were not at the time of the US launch. And two, American consumers were more educated about CD technology. The Turbo CD launched ahead of actual commercial demand for such a product. Further, NEC needed to sell the Turbo CD as an optional add-on that stood on its own merits and not attempt to upsell the outrageously expensive Total Turbo Graphics Super System. The US launch would have been far better off without it. Also, as everyone knows, the Turbo Graphics really needed a better pack in game. At the very least, it needed to be a recognizable game. And to me, clearly the pack in game should have been R Type, which was probably the most celebrated and talked about game available for the Turbo Graphics 16 at launch. And finally, Bonk's Adventure had been released in Japan that December in 1989. NEC in the United States really could have and needed to make that game come out in time for the TurboGrafx's first Christmas season in the US. But instead it came out early in 1990 to critical acclaim, but too late to help bolster TurboGrafx sales at that most critical juncture. With enough forward thinking and marketing, the TurboGrafx packaged with that much beloved mascot could have held its own against Nintendo, two years before Sega released Sonic. Simultaneous US-Japan video game launches are logistically complicated, especially back then, 
but Sega managed to do the very same thing that year with their own Genesis games. For example, Ghouls and Ghosts. If Sega can do it, so could have NEC and Hudson Soft. The TurboGrafx-16 didn't go very well for NEC and Hudson Soft, but perhaps it will be a big win for Konami in 2020. So why do you guys think the TurboGrafx-16 failed in the United States? Did you actually own one yourself? And what do you all think about the TurboGrafx-16 Mini being $100 and launching with an optional turbo tap and AC adapter? Is history about to repeat itself? Have you made the pre-order for yourselves? Again, thank you for watching and bye for now.